Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from everyone here at No Rolls Bar. 2021 is almost done with us. Bring on 2022. There's a number of hugely exciting games coming out this year, not least of all perennial John Gracie Torture Engine Blood on the Clock Tower. Get in my hands, you bloody beautiful looking box. But those are the days to come. This list is all about the tabletop year that tabletop was. NRB real ones. Remember, we didn't do a top 10 of 2020 last year because we were only ducked back then and also you know the thing so here we are stretching our swan wings to make it up to you with a full-blown top 20 there's a rainbow of raucous fun funny social and devilish games up in this bitch and even some air quotes proper games to get you a list maker who does it all i'm adam from no rolls bard and here are my top 10 20 board games of 20 21. And while you're here, if you didn't subscribe to No Rolls Bard, why not make a New Year's resolution that you can actually stick to and subscribe now? It means the world to us, genuinely. Like, it, it helps us pay the bills. You'd be surprised. So if you haven't, and you could, that would be great. Number 20, Destinies. Oh, I really can't rank this higher than 20th because if I'm being honest, I don't really like Destinies that much, but it's a game that's super interesting and has really stuck with me, so make of that what you will. Destinies is an app-driven competitive storytelling game, which just boggles my mind a little. You all play characters exploring a land, discovering characters, rolling these gorgeous dice to perform skill checks, gaining XP, navigating it all through this beautiful app. Look at these minis! Look how pretty it all is! But here's the trick. You win the game by being the first to fulfill Feel your destiny, which is an end game bit of story you unlock by doing subquests. It's essentially a racing game where you're racing to unlock all of your story first, which is tense and joyous and fascinating if you win, and incredibly frustrating if you don't, because your character's epilogue that you're working hard to see just vanishes as soon as someone else achieves their destiny. It's a gorgeous game, unlike any I've played this year or most other years, and it doesn't completely work, but damn, I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't at least mention it. Number 19, So Clover. I love this little puzzle. So it's obvious that NRB likes games about communicating clues in unorthodox ways. We love wavelength, code names, decrypto, or all that jazz. And so Clover belongs in the same league as those legends. Everyone gets one of these Clover boards and secretly slots in four cards. That gives them four pairs of words. And above each pair, you write a clue. When you have four clues, remove your cards, add one more from the deck, shuffle them up, then hand your empty Clover and the cards to your friends who then have to try and work out which cards went where and in what positions based on your terrible thumb-brained clues. You idiot, Sully. Make a resolution to not be such an idiot. It's a bunch of fun, monstrously easy to teach, a proper whole family game, and it's cheap too. Number 18, Meadow. Oh, this is so lovely. Probably most tranquil, solitary, and non-combative game on this list, which normally are turn-offs for me, but I can't help it. This game just makes my heart sore. It's a really simple game. On your turn, you place a token on this board to gain a card, most likely. A card you'll want to play in your meadow, but in order to play some cards, you first need to collect other cards with matching symbols, and at the end of the game, you add up all the points on all the cards you were able to play. It's standard set collection fair, but Meadow is a shiny example of why theme matters in a board game. I just want to keep playing in order to see more of these cards. Look at them. Look how nice they are. A gorgeous game of nature and all things natural. I fully expect Tom to get lost in this game and never return to civilization. Number 17, Equinox. Want to trick your friends into playing a really mean game by convincing him it'll actually be really cute? Then Equinox is for you. A game by the good doctor of board games, Reiner Knizia. That's actually the third life this game has had, previously being published as Colossal Arena and Grand National Derby. The game sees you place eight fantastical creatures in essentially a fighting tournament. After five rounds, only three of these creatures will remain, with the creature with the lowest strength being eliminated each round. You win by betting on which creature will survive, and then working to make sure all the other creatures perish while yours stays strong. You get more points by betting early, but that of course puts a target on your creature's back, and holy table flips, Batman. It's surprisingly cutthroat, cruelly depowering another creature, consigning them to the Gruffalo's dustbin. This little singing mushroom can f off. It's like the evil Blair. Kill it, all while your wonderful owl flourishes. Mean, beautiful, mean, but above all, 
mean. Number 16, Kabuto Sumo. I love me a gorgeous, aggressive oddity. See this unrelated picture of Isaac. If a game does a thing I haven't seen before, even if it's occasionally quite a lumpy play, I'm going to like it so much more than goods trading engine builder number 4068. Look at this little weirdo. Kabuto Sumo is a game where you play bug sumo wrestlers who have to knock each other off this platform and you do it by slowly pushing pieces onto the board so others fall off. It's like tipping point. I can't believe there's a tip point board game, except you know the official tipping point board game. Every piece that you knock off the board becomes a weapon you can use. Each wrestler has special pieces you can bring into play, and you win when your opponents fall over the edge. Sometimes the game can drag if you're both really good at it, but it's such a genuinely very delightful experience. Number 15, Picture Perfect. Like Brooke, this is another lovely little weirdo. Picture Perfect is all about crafting the perfect photograph. Every player is going to have a bunch of Downton Abbey style Tories looking to have their picture taken around this table. There's 14 of them and 14 places to put them, except like all Tories, these people have demands hidden away in their envelopes. Demands like, I don't want to stand next to this person or I want to stand in the back row. All these envelopes will be swapped around the group. In some cases, you can auction them off. So everyone's constantly shuffling their Tories around as new information arises, struggling to remember past demands, creating a wonderfully tangled mess of bodies, all jostling for space around the table and in your brain. A silly but lovely toy to play with. Also, there's a Corgi in it, which automatically makes it one of the games of the year. Number 14, The Initiative. Do you like really tense Hangman? Then you'll love The Initiative. I've undersold it there. I love how this game meshes two different styles of game. One half is action economy pandemic style, splitting up, putting out fires, taking risks. The other half is using data that you find on your travels to crack codes before the time runs out. Spend actions to move around the board, avoid traps and enemies, find these tiles, use them to decode other letters, guess the phrase or sequence based based on the letters you've decoded to win. That is a fun game already. But the sheer joy of this box is the campaign that takes the form of a delightful comic that you flip through, filled with extra puzzles, extra cards, codes to crack, and little hidden surprises that I refuse to spoil. It is a treasure trove of puzzling riches, and I love it. Number 13, Burgle Bros 2. Tim Fowers makes very pretty games, most of which with a beautiful 60s evoking sensibility. The most beautiful and most 60s evoking came out this year. A Rat Pack Ocean's Eleven co-op game all about heisting a casino and it's glorious. The first Burgle Bros game was very good, but this one is quite literally another level. Look, it comes with its own little tower you build out of the game box to make the two-story casino. I love that. I love that for me. You all play criminals moving around the casino, uncovering tiles, avoiding pitfalls, helping each other out with your gear, dodging the patrolling bouncers, all while trying to locate and crack a safe. So far, so fun. What pushes it into game of the year territory, though, is it comes with a campaign with a series of finales. When the safe opens, the finale begins. You find the item that's inside, and it gives you a game within a game you have to complete in order to win. It's a stunning little tension machine and so beautiful. Number 12, Horrified American Monsters. At No Rolls Bard, we're huge fans of American Monsters. That's why we keep inviting Carly to keep playing Clock Tower with us, despite her proclivity towards slaughtering us all with a smile. The original Horrified became an instant classic of the co-op genre, a perfect lightweight family game you can use to introduce new players to gaming, all while battling recognizable, spooky, universal monsters. The sequel, which we managed to smuggle to the UK in a shipping crate alongside the Ark of the Covenant, takes that beloved form formula and reframes it pitting players against American cryptids like Bigfoot, Mothman, the Jersey Devil and more. It's another gorgeous bit of production from Prospero Hall and all the monsters have a slight increase in complexity making it not just a reskin of the original Horrified but the perfect next step for fans of that original and again look how pretty. Number 11 Mandala Stones. The beautiful games start coming and they don't stop coming. A lot of people associate abstract games chess, checkers, backgammon etc with brain burn complexity but also a slight sense of design drabness. Not so Mandala Stones which is a joyous explosion of colour 
on the table. Beautiful and difficult, like me, the game sees players moving these artist tokens around the board and collecting all the stones around them to place on their player boards in the form of towers. You're trying to build towers of these tokens so that when you score them, you get points based on a number of different objectives. Scoring this tower gets you points for how many different height towers you have, this one for how many different colors in one tower, this one for how high a specific tower is. It's a crunchy little puzzle, but hey, if you're gonna be staring at a board, pondering your next move, it's always nice when that board is drop dead stunning to look at. Number 10, Knight of the Ninja. Pretty much everyone I've ever met in the board gaming world really likes One Night Ultimate Werewolf. The Knight of the Ninja creeps up behind that game and slides a katana between its ribs. It is exceptional social deduction. You've seen us play it on Board Game Club, and if you haven't, do that immediately, but here's how it works. Two houses, both alike in ninja -ty. Lotus and Crane, everyone is a member of one of those houses, but no one knows who anyone else is. During the night, open brackets of the ninja, close brackets, you need to locate the highest ranked members of the opposite house and make sure they're dead by dawn. Huge amounts of conflicting data, bluffing, accusations, murders, reversals of fortune. It's a mad amount of fun and the best high player count game that came out this year, bar none. Play it with chaotic friends like Rosie. Rosie is a very good ninja. Number nine, hit the silk. And speaking of joyous madness and confusion, another board game club favorite playing hit the silk is like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle in the back of a dodgem while someone else is punching you in the eye. You're all criminals in a plane after a heist. The plane is plummeting to earth. There are fewer parachutes shoots than players, so you have to do two things before the time runs out. One, find a parachute for yourself. Two, make sure everyone who does have a parachute has, between them, enough money to settle your gambling debt. All while your plane is f crashing. That means non-stop paranoia, haggling, threats, begging, shackling your friends to Dom with handcuffs, the same Dom that you've also poisoned. It is a wonderful mess. One of the year's best surprises. Number eight, Dune, a game of conquest and diplomacy. Another big surprise of the year. I love the original Dune, designed by the Cosmic Encounter lads. It's a long, complex, slow-moving game of betrayal and warfare. I was skeptical when Gale Force 9 announced a streamlined version of the game to coincide with the film, but hot damn if this isn't somehow better than the original, which could take hours on end if all the players were smart. The new Dune, a game of conquest and diplomacy, gives you five, count them, five turns. It also massively speeds up how quickly you can move around the map, which turns a devious marathon into a violent sprint, cramming every inch of the running time with battles, traitors, death, and destruction. It is so gloriously efficient, and our board game club playthrough proved three things. One, I love this game. Two, I'm bad at this game and still love it anyway. And three, Laurie is a Harkonnen in every bloody sense of the word. Number seven, Fast and Furious, Highway Heist. I can't believe it either. The Fast and Furious game is legit one of the best games of the year. And it's all about family and cars and stunts and explosions. And it fucking rocks ass. The game sees all players working together. It is all about family after all. To complete one of three scenarios. Taking down a tank, robbing a semi, or taking down a helicopter. All on a stretch of highway, one quarter mile at a time. On your turn, you could do bonkers fun things. Ramming cars, turning them into wrecks that will smash into other cars like Domino Toretto's, jumping your people from one car to another, fist fighting on moving vehicles, completing stunts by lining up cars perfectly, rolling dice it is so madly fun. And look at these lovely toys. Prospero Hall, you've done it again. Another perfect family game. Grab yourself a vest and a bucket of Coronas. It is bafflingly fun. Number six, Unfathomable, also known as John Gracie's favorite game and not at all the easiest way to make him unravel like a spool of wool tumbling down the fucking stairs. It's a reskin of long out of print and much beloved social deduction epic Battlestar Galactica, only with some streamlined rules, some fish instead of Cylons, and lying traitorous bastards instead of actually no, that's still the same. It is a monster game in multiple ways. It's bloody hard, bloody mean, an epic struggle of putting out fires in a factory that is specifically engineered to make fire. All players are trying to keep the ship afloat, defeat monsters, solve crises, or while some of them are secret fish sympathizers working against the common good. Cruelty in gaming form, and it's beautiful. Number five, The Crew, Mission Deep Sea. Few games make you love and then hate your friends as much as this one. Each game sees you with a hand of cards of multiple suits, with a certain number of tasks 
to complete. Each game, you work with more tasks, harder tasks. It's a brilliant learning curve and so addictive as each new game offers a new twist. It's a trick-taking game, which means someone leads with a suit. If you have a card of that suit, you have to play it. Then when everyone's played a card, whoever played the card with the highest value of the right suit, wins the trick and hopefully accomplishes one of their tasks in doing so. And what really makes the game a classic is that you cannot talk about your hand of cards beyond one tiny bit of information, making it part deduction, part long-term planning, part risk-taking, all tension, all fun, with victory always being punched the air joyous. Number four, Cascadia. Cascadia is a delightful little puzzle, a simple but astoundingly clever game of building the perfect animal habitat, one elk at a time. There are four tiles in the middle of the table and four animal tokens. On your go, you simply take one tile from the top row and it's matching token from the bottom. You connect the tile to your expanding nature reserve and pop the animal on any free tile with that animal symbol on it. Simple as that. But the joy of the game is there are so many different ways to earn points. By giving you that, Cascadia becomes a devious matrix of options. Most of them good, but which is the most good? Putting habitats of the same type together gets you points. That's good. But also, each of the five animals types has their own rule to net you more points. Bears might want to huddle together in groups. Salmon might want to have one line of them snaking through your habitat. Hawks might want to be on the same line as each other, but not next to each other for God's sake. And trying to make all these animals and their rules coexist in one patchwork that you're slowly building is somehow calming yet tense, simple to understand yet hard to execute, and utterly utterly addictive. Number three, Summoner Wars Second Edition. If you know me at all, you'll know that I love bloody love Unmatched. Sadly, owing to COVID and other licensing problems, we in the UK haven't had an Unmatched game in 2021. Thank the Lord then for Summoner Wars Second Edition, a remake of a Stone Cold classic. I never played Summoner Wars before this year, and now, friends, I have played a lot of Summoner Wars. It's a two-player game with each player controlling a summoner. Each turn, you'll be spawning creatures on the battlefield, moving them, defeating foes to gain magic. Magic you'll need to spend on bigger, better creatures, all while keeping your summoner safe from harm, because if they die game over. So far, so standard, but like Unmatched, what makes Summoner Wars immensely satisfying and replayable is that every faction is ludicrously OP in their own way, making each matchup a unique puzzle. One faction lets you spawn hordes of weak enemies, but you can do it for free. One lets you hurt yourself to bring your creatures back to life. One lets you possess other players' fighters. It is cat and mouse glory, but the cat and mouse are both armed with bazookas. I love it so much. Number two, Mind Management. What a beast. Mind Management is a hidden movement game like Whitehall Mystery, but Whitehall Mystery on psychedelic drugs. Look at this art. Beautiful. Fun fact, it's based on an excellent graphic novel by Matt Kind, who also provided art for the game. It sees one player acting as a recruiter, moving invisibly around the map using features on that map, like this suggestive billboard, this bus full of drugs, I'm assuming, or this evil swimming pool to brainwash recruits to the evil cause of mind management. Everyone else plays as rogue agents using those same features of the map to track down the recruiter, find out where they've been, when they were there, and arrest them before it's too late. It is a phenomenal production. The art is haunting. And not only is the base game fun, there's also a campaign style shift system where whichever side lost the last game, they get to open one of these little boxes, each with a tiny little comic inside and an extra feature that'll give that side an advantage for the next game. It's possibly the best board game production of the year. And number one, Sleeping Gods. Man, it was really hard to pick a favorite this year. Genuinely, I, any of my top five, depending on my mood, could have been game of the year, but for sheer amount of game in a box, I just have to give it to Sleeping Gods. It's an epic storytelling adventure in a single beautiful package. All players work together to guide Captain Sophie Odessa and her crew of the Manticore as they explore the wandering seas. As they travel, the players will pick up quests that will lead to various places in this atlas, gorgeously drawn, stuffed with tiny little visual clues, encounter lots of stories all written in this wonderful tome crammed with choices, dangers, challenges to pass, characters to meet. Hope you guys like funny voices. I happen to know a certain Sullivan who's excellent at them. You'll fight monsters, collect new friends, look a dog, hooray, buy new gear, collect resources, keep the ship afloat, solve mysteries. There's an unbelievable amount of life hidden away here, so much so that you'll want to spend hours on a Sunday just sailing 
slowly through this world. But it's not just hours of taking it in turns to read from a book. The mysteries are wonderful, but it all rests on a really solid foundation of actual game. Managing resources, the health of your crew, the health of the manticore, upgrading your crew to make sure they're well enough to travel with you on this journey. Honestly, it is crazy how much you will come to care about these characters, these curious waters, and the curious creatures that slumber beneath them. And that's our list. What's been your favorite game you played in 2021? Let us know below. Please like and subscribe to help us have a wonderful 2022 here at No Rolls Bard. Happy New Year, everyone, and get on board.